Uh, I'm Andrew Dickerson. I'm the director of software engineering uh, for the Samsung VR team here in Richardson. Uh, we've got Jeff Wilkinson, who's a uh, lead developer on the VR app that we'll show, and then Scott, who's our lead designer for Samsung VR. How's it going? Uh, a lot of people don't know, but uh, Gear VR and Oculus Rift were made right here in Dallas. Um, so the very first Gear VR prototypes our team built years ago. Uh, and the Oculus Rift uh, was built by Oculus, uh, obviously in California some, but uh, John Carmack, who uh, was the uh, founder of id Software, uh, is also here in town in the Oculus office. Um, so they um, do a lot of work for VR uh, as well. Uh, so we're going to cover kind of the mobile side of things. So this is uh, Gear VR. Uh, who who else familiar with the Gear VR in the group? Everybody? Has anybody written software for Gear VR? Anybody written software for any of any VR headset? This summer. Okay. Yeah. And you've tried the Vibes, obviously, I guess, since yeah. they're out in the hallway. Um, it's a competition, kind of, but we're all, <laughs> we all get along in VR land. Uh, so we'll talk about what mobile VR is versus what desktop VR is. Um, Gear VR is powered entirely by Samsung phones. So the Note 4 phone, Note 5, uh, S, S6, S7, S8, all power Gear VR, so you can plug any of those phones into Gear VR, and it downloads all the VR software automatically, and then you're in these experiences that we're showing. Uh, we also have the Gear 360 camera. Uh, we also announced a new version of this that kind of has a, uh, a cylinder on the bottom of it to hold it. Uh, so there's Gear 360, this is the original Gear 360, and then there's Gear 360 2017, which is a newer version of this camera. Um, this makes 360 degree videos, which is what our service, Samsung VR, uh, is. You can kind of think of Samsung VR as a YouTube or Netflix of 360 video. Um, so we host it on SamsungVR.com, which anybody can go to on their phone or, or browsers or desktops uh, and view all these videos. But the videos are primarily for immersive experiences in VR. So in Gear VR, we have an app that runs that lets you feel like you're in that place. So it immerses you into uh, those videos. So what's, we could just, at a super high level, can anybody tell me what the difference between AR and VR is? So separating you maybe from the real world. So virtual reality's intent is to take you to a different place, and augmented reality is to mix more information into the real world, basically. Um, there's lots of different hardware to do that. Uh, these are all virtual reality devices, so you've seen some of them and tried some of them, obviously. Um, the mobile spectrum's on the right side of this, so the cost is lower, uh, the experience is a little bit less than the high-end desktops. So uh, Gear VR today just does rotation. So it doesn't know if I've moved two feet to the left or two feet to the right. Uh, there are systems that you can add on to Gear VR that will do position tracking. And position tracking will come in the future for Gear VR. But right now, if you want full position tracking, so the ability to walk around a room, these three headsets are the only ones that currently in the market uh, do that. These three are mobile and are just rotational right now. So the immersion's different, and kind of the way you design the app is a little bit different. Uh, these are AR devices, and again, these aren't as prevalent as some of these devices, um, mainly because some of them aren't sold to consumers yet. But uh, these mix in uh, real world uh, light with uh, CG. So we talked about that, talked about that. So the other thing we have, uh, the latest Gear VR that was announced has a controller. Uh, the controller is the same way. It does rotation. It does not understand if you move your hand you know, a foot to the left or the foot to the right. But it works as a laser pointer in VR so you can select things, uh, a gun, trigger, um, picking up things, et cetera. So it's very similar. It has a touchpad here, uh, home and back buttons, volume up and down, and then uh, trigger on the end. So what's different now about what are some things to consider, I guess, when you're developing for VR? Uh, anybody know? What are some? Right. So what, what, what causes users to get sick? Yeah. Yeah. So, so any, the rule we have is anytime you move in the virtual world in a way that you're not moving in the real world, you're going to make a person sick. So one of the most common videos for people to do in Gear VR is I got to see a roller coaster video. That's the first thing they, they come and do. I got to get on a roller coaster video. 
Unfortunately, that's not the best experience um, for, for motion sickness um, because you're moving on a roller coaster uh, in a way that you're not uh, in the real world. Now, there are some ways to mitigate that. So if you put somebody in a 4D chair that moves kind of like the roller coaster moves, then they're moving more like the virtual world in the real world. And so that, that mitigates the motion sickness quite a bit. There's other ways to mitigate motion sickness too, um, which we can talk about here. So you got these crazy things, right? It's moves you in lots of different ways. Uh, <laughs> drops, makes you feel like you're dropping, makes you feel like you're turning, just like the roller coaster turns. So you're moving most of the time just like the roller coaster moves in this case. Uh, let me jump to the end here where the... So, <laughs> so what we just talked about is the vestibular. So if you're... Uh, vestibular system thinks that you're moving in a way that you're not moving in the real world. You'll get nauseous just like you get seasick. There's vergence accommodation conflict, which is you're actually looking at a screen that's much closer to you than what you're used to, so your focus is a little bit different. You've focused on something closer than what you usually do in the real world. You can focus on 3D in depth quite a ways out. And this is not necessarily as much about motion sickness as it is about just eye strain in general. These two are kind of more of an eye strain causer than they are uh, motion sickness. So the screen refresh rates, flicker, et cetera, uh, are what kind of impact uh, eye strain. And, and if you don't keep 60 frames a second on Gear VR or 90 frames a second on the Rift, you're going to also make people sick because their eyes can tell that they're not moving as fast as they would usually expect. So here's some ways that you can also counteract things, or at least the studies that people have done. So Interim 4D is actually an electrical pad that Samsung has developed, a group in C-Lab, um, that can make you feel like you're turning even though you're not turning in the real world. So it actually puts an electric pulse on the back of your vestibular system and you kind of feel like you're moving. Uh, it is kind of strange. feels a little creepy when you first try it. <laughs> uh, Purdue University did a study where if you put a virtual nose, so the more you ground somebody in VR, so if you, if you build like a platform for somebody to stand on, so the roller coaster maybe is going, but you have a lot of the car or the roller coaster will make you feel uh, more balanced and have less, uh, less motion that way. Uh, restricting field of view is something that we just released in Samsung VR. So you can actually uh, put kind of gradients on the top and the bottom and narrow the field of view a little bit. And the user won't even notice, but you will have narrowed their vertical field of view. Uh, and there'll be less motion shift as a result of that. That's obviously counterintuitive to what you typically want to do in VR is, is you know, have a 180 degree field of view in both directions since that's what the user sees. So the bigger field of view, the better. But if you can kind of cheat that some, um, you can counterbalance uh, motion sickness that way as well. So this is a picture of that. So the human user, uh, I guess some more things to consider about UI is it's easier for you to move your head this way than it is to move your head this way. So a lot of layouts and UI in VR is designed to work left to right. Uh, same with field of view. You're more likely to see things in your periphery because you're looking for uh, a line attacking you from the grass to the side of you or whatever naturally, as opposed to up and down. So you're not as sensitive to field of view up and down because you have eyelids, um, eyelashes that you're used to having kind of flicker in your face. So taking away from the vertical field of view is actually very easy to do without uh, the user really noticing. So this is an example of that, right? So this is the King Kong video in Samsung VR. Before, tiny tweak after, where we take a tiny little bit off the top and bottom, and the motion sickness in the video goes down by 20%. So we, we're from a team that writes Samsung VR. Uh, again, we have a VR version of the app that has tens of thousands of videos inside of a VR app that are browsable, uh, a mobile app, which you can all download on your Android phones, that lets you flip through the videos, and then a web app, samsungvr.com, that hosts all these videos, which we were had up on the screen here earlier. So we work with lots of different partners. Obviously, they've, we've got a bunch of Hollywood studios and such that have built uh, different videos and have hosted them with us. So this is an experience we did uh, called Santa Slay. But the problem is, is that 
it's obviously more immersive to be inside a VR to watch these videos. If you watch these flat and kind of scroll around with your hand, it's not nearly as immersive as it is in Gear VR. So the best way to try out immersion in VR is in VR, uh, not on a flat page or app. So this piece was made with uh, real cameras and CG. So there's real footage here mixed in with CG footage. So talk a little bit about just numbers in general. If you're going to develop an app for VR, uh, all these companies are investing to get you know hardware out there for you to to, to sell to. Um, Gear VR is the number one. Uh, count on number of headsets that are out in the world. So if you want to make money on a game, you should design it for mobile probably, or should, certainly should consider designing it for mobile, because we have a lot more units out there than the, the higher end desktop units do currently. So why do, why do we add distortion? to when you, when you look at VR, you see something that looks like this, right? What's the reason for the distortion? Right. Yeah, so the, the lenses that we have to get you to be able to see something close actually put a warp that looks like this. And if you put a warp that goes the other way, it, it corrects the distortion. So if you have these two lenses, they cause a warp themselves because they're curved. You add distortion, and then the final rendering looks like this when it's not in the headset, but after you put the lenses in front of it, it's flat. Lenses also cause chromatic aberration, so on the outer edge of the lens, things look like they have split color so you can kind of see blues and reds and, and such, kind of like you see here. This is chromatic aberration out here. There's uh, software shaders that can take this and, and convert it back into something that looks, uh, you know, without the chromatic aberration on it, so it looks like solid color. So, you know, where is VR going? Uh, we obviously think that mobile is going to be the most important because there'll be the most number of units in mobile. Um, there'll be Full position tracking, it won't just be rotational in mobile. Uh, so you'll be able to do the same thing on the desktop headsets as you can on the mobile headsets. Uh, there'll be hand tracking. There's lots of different ways to track your hands. You can have cameras sitting out here that track your hands, cameras here that track your hands in front of you, um, magnetic coils that can track where your hands are, um, what other hand tracking technologies. Uh, gloves. gloves can track your hands and your fingers, uh, although gloves are not super easy to put on. The average user is used to being at home and picking up you know, a PlayStation controller or, a, or an Xbox controller, and that takes half a second. Putting on a glove takes 20, 30 seconds. Gloves get nasty at conferences. If you pass it to 10,000 people during a conference, a glove gets pretty dirty. Um, so yeah, so there's reasons for you know, controllers more like this that track some of your finger gestures as opposed to uh, gloves. Uh, and the Vive is the same way. Those controllers are much easier to hand to somebody uh, and still get hand tracking and some gesture tracking uh, than a glove. Uh, so we've got, you know, 360 video is the best for immersion, uh, at least in, in, in a rotational only world. But what do you do when you have, you know, full position tracking to capture the real world? So does any, has anybody seen demos of what you do to capture the real world when you have position tracking? what would be in a, an example there. All right, so if you capture a 360 video and all of a sudden your headset knows that it can move, a 360 video, you're basically in a video that's just a sphere. So you're in the very center of the video. If you move a foot to the left or a foot to the right, it'll feel like that sphere is getting closer to you, kind of like you're in a box and the side of the box gets closer to your face, which is, doesn't feel normal. You don't feel centered then anymore and the video doesn't seem natural. But if you're position tracking and you move like you can in the Vive headset. If you want to capture the real world, there's uh, what we call volumetric video, which is the idea that, and the way to create this volumetric video today is to have a whole bunch of cameras around the outside of a room, do photogrammetry of everything in the center of the room, which is building 3D models of everyone that's in the room, basically. So in this room, we would put 20 cameras on all sides of the room, film everybody in the center, and then build 3D models of everyone that's in the center of the room. And that would actually physically let me walk with my headset to you uh, and walk around you just like I do you know, as I'm walking to you today. Like mocap. Like mocap. Um, 
But that's super expensive in terms of data size, uh, super expensive in terms of data rigs or rigs to set up to capture it, and it's not something that you can easily do at home today. It's not something that you would just, you know, you don't set up 20 cameras in your house uh, to create a 3D, 3D model of yourself at any given time. It's but, expensive. Yeah. But we think that that's kind of where, uh, where some of this will go as position tracking becomes more, uh, more important. Uh, don't forget that audio is important in VR too. So uh, typically on TVs, you just have you know, stereo audio or 5.1 audio maybe, or 7.1 if you have a nice speaker system. But in VR, as you turn your head, the audio needs to adjust so that you know, as I turn my head this way, I need you to sound like you're out here and not uh, just st still in front of me. Um, so uh, our, our video, Samsung VR service, has uh, spatial audio formats in it that let you provide audio in a way that our system can rotate that audio as you rotate your head. Any questions about any of that? Uh, in your professional opinion, do you believe that VR is the future of media? Uh, so some have said that it's the last, uh, the last platform um, because it lets you immerse into 3D in a way that none of the other platforms do. Uh, I think that's true, but I think we're a long way away from from that happening. Yeah. So I, I, I think. I mean, you're not going to walk around town with this on your face, or whatever, yeah, right? Years, right. Movies, TV, will be all in VR. Yeah, I think so. Most movies today have VR pieces that are being done with them. So, really? like Disney, for every movie they make that's on the big screen, they make a VR piece now. So. Um, so it's certainly uh, headed in that direction, um, but it's a question of you know the hardware needs to catch up to to the software in some sense. I mean these things need to become something more like sunglasses, um, and sunglasses that can not only mix in the real world but sunglasses that can block out the real world too. So that's a it's a difficult problem to have something that's small enough to be comfortable to wear around town and look nice enough to wear around town because most people are actually moving away from just regular glasses even, I mean, with LASIK and all that. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, as, as these things become smaller uh, and more compact, I think they're, it will be pervasive everywhere. And keep in mind that it's two different problems, AR and VR, in some sense that the goal of this headset is to block out light from the world around you. So it actually, we do a lot of work to make sure that the bottom level here doesn't leak light. We have pads to make sure that light doesn't leak in because the more light that leaks in, the more you feel like you're, you haven't been removed from the real world. You feel a sense like, I could sense Scott being here more if I have light leak that lets me kind of see him in my peripheral vision out of the goggles. So just, just switching to glasses, there's a lot of light leak with glasses, right? So I can see out to the left here, my glasses up, down, right, and then obviously forward. Even if this was completely black lenses, it wouldn't let me see completely opaque lenses. Right. Um, so there's, there's some issues with physics involved in making something that's good hardware for VR and AR. So I think the two will remain separate for a while. You can develop AR applications with Gear VR. So when the phone's sitting here in the Gear VR, the front-facing camera is forward. Um, so you can build AR apps where you can see the real world and overlay uh, CG on top of it. Uh, one problem with today's setup, the camera's an inch to the right. And there's only one camera. You're used to having two cameras and they're you know, 65 millimeters apart or 62 to 65 millimeters apart, which is IPD, which is your eye spacing. Um, so ideally, the camera would be you know, centered up here and there'd be two of them and they'd be lined up with your eyes. Uh, the other problem that really hasn't been solved very well is for an image to get into the camera and onto the display, it takes maybe 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. So you're delayed what you see in VR from the real world. So if you're walking around, if I'm walking around with Gear VR today, and people do this, if I'm walking around, I feel like I'm an inch to the right of where I really am. So I'll bump into walls and some that went around the corner. And I don't see depth because there's only one per eye. Uh, and it's delayed, you know, two or three hundred milliseconds. Is it not cost efficient right now to create a new, like, proprietary new system just for that sort of view? Yeah, so there, there's lots of experiments around that, um, and we will one day ship uh, something that does that. Um, but there's lots of Samsung and other companies have built, you know, prototypes that do that. 
It's just a matter of most people, I think in the store, there's, there's one AR application for Gear VR in the store today. Most games are completely virtual. There's not, not an AR experience really that ships much in the store. So it's completely virtual uh, games and movie experiences. And the breakdown's kind of 55 or 56% of people enjoy video experiences. And then the other 44% are games. So um, my name is Scott March, and uh, I do uh, design for uh, Samsung VR. And my background is predominantly gaming. And so I think a lot of VR companies uh, look for that as a kind of a background. Uh, I've been making games for 17 years, my, or 18 years now. My, uh, um, I was making VR games before I came on board at Samsung. And uh, Jeff Wilkinson, too, which we have a history together, he's a, he's a longtime game developer, too. And what I typically do, and you guys are in a cool program for game development, and I work with Chris here at the school as far as on uh, curriculum and things that you guys are learning and applying to classes, is, you know, how do we get you guys, you know, um, uh, on many levels, you know, with, with your skill set, you know, working in the industry. And I think game development is awesome because not only do you, can you focus as, uh, as games as a career, you can you can learn UI design, you can learn video, you can learn editing. So a lot of the uh, web design, mobile design, and so a lot of the skill sets you guys are learning in game development. I know everyone likes games, but you should be looking at those skill sets and how you can apply them to all kinds of jobs. And so a lot of companies, I think, out there now are starting to realize that game developers have a lot of those skills uh, under their tool tool belt. So they have. You know, they look at things differently. They approach things from a different philosophy. And so when you guys are looking at things from a different perspective and with design is how do you apply that to VR? And uh, to me, VR is an up and coming space. I think there's, it's creating uh, more jobs in the, in the industry and it's gonna you know, roll out into real, real estate to you know, psychology, to uh, the medical field, to video, to interactive video, to mixed reality, which is like video with CG. So you're taking computer graphics and mixing them in. I don't know if you guys have, uh, there's a company called Digital Domain. I think I've seen them do a lot of really neat uh, uh, photogrammetry slash film where they project you, know, you in a virtual room and they actually get footage and they map a one-to-one -one, uh, CG model to a movie star or a character. So he's so when you're in that 3D space and you're in that immersion, you can go around a famous person that you know like from a movie and you can kind of see them from all the different perspectives and different angles. And, and so some of the things I'm seeing people do where they're mixing film with CG and graphics are some of my favorite things. And so I'm pretty excited to be on board at Samsung to get, you know, get to work with a lot of those different things. And I know you guys are uh, working with Unity. Unity is a great tool to help you get things up and running. There's lots of demos that are available on VR so you can load, download their content, look at what they're doing. And Unreal, Unreal 4, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I, I know Chris knows that too. And so uh, I've been working with Unreal off and on for a long time. I actually even use it some at, at Samsung. So I use Unity and an Unreal Engine there to do projects. And, and uh, Unreal is also making a big effort and stride to push the, the boundaries of mobile with uh, Vulkan and some of the shader work that they're doing on, on VR for mobile. How many people here are interested in like VR as a platform outside of console or PC, just in general? Okay. Has everybody here done, I think everyone did, has done VR. Okay, so um, one of the things that I do too, which I, before I came on board at Samsung, is I've been making games. I have a small business that makes video games, and that's what I was gonna talk about today. And so one of the games we, we worked on and released is a World War II game, and I targeted that for uh, Samsung VR, and that's part of the, part of the reason why I was, they were interested in, in me at Samsung is because of my, my game background. And uh, some of the things I want to talk about is like design flow or design process. I don't have a lot of time, so I'll have to go fast. And I, um, it's kind of nice. I have a, a video that someone made, so I can kind of take you through some of that, and you can kind of watch the, the, uh, the game. And so one of the things I want to talk about is like design, design ph uh, philosophy and process. And, and so when, whenever I make a game, I, uh, I use tons of reference material. I don't ever just start, oh, I'm going to make this. I use uh, film. I use books. I use... Uh, everything around me and all my my background and I use history you know so it depends on what you're going to target or what you're going to kind of do and so um, I, I build lots of reference I think about the process and then I use a, a lot of different approaches as far as like well how's the game going to start you know wh wh where what are, what are the characters you know is it going to be a first person third person and I think you guys do some of that in, in school here so um, the, the and the first level we designed I, I was with my team like working on like the game and and we had like this we start we wanted to start it on this empty road and we had this empty road and I was looking at everyone I was like so 
if we're playing a first-person shooter or a third-person shooter, you know, how do we want the game to start? Because a lot of people, oh, you just come in and guys pop up and you shoot them. And I was like, no, that's kind of boring. You know, we need to come up with a better, a better, you know, to make things immersive and make them feel more realistic. I wanted something simple, and so I kind of always, when I work with people, I always like want to see what they come up with. I always, I think, no idea is a bad idea. I mean, some ideas are going to come out really bad, but when you're working and collaborating with teams and people, you don't want to like diss on people for their ideas. You want to kind of look at them and it, and let the best ideas rise to the top. And some ideas, even though they're may, they may be bad and everyone knows it, they may help you think about another idea that'll, that'll make it better. And so to me, I really believe in team collaboration and working with people that help you do that. I tend to surround myself around really smart technical people like these two guys over here on the right, because I, I, if you're an artist or a creative, you always want to latch on to the engineers so they can make your vision happen, right? You guys, am I, you guys tracking with me? So, and then the engineers want their stuff to look really cool, so they want to grab artists. So it's really a cool dynamic when you have left and right brain thinkers coming together, because when you put them together, you make magic. You make really cool things happen. And so uh, I, I, I strongly you know, suggest that you guys work, to work with each other and latch on and come to teams, and I think you guys are doing that in the, in the project. So when, we, when I started the game, we had this like open road, right? And, and and you know you have like the trees and, and you're in the forest and you're doing whatever you know I, I you know let a few guys come up with some thing you know some ideas of like hey you know um, you're starting the game and we're in our, you know you're in a, it's a World War II game so we're in our tank and they're like well you know I, I love starting with a blank canvas it's like as an artist you have this clean slate and you can start coming up with things. Uh, this is where the reference comes in and to, to power and to play. So I strongly recommend using things like uh, National Geographic. Oops, this came off. Like using magazines, National Geographic, you know, you know, things. I can flip through a National Geographic magazine and like look at pictures and get ideas. Like, and it's kind of like looking at a blank canvas is what do you see? When I see a picture, I see I see game content. When I see uh, you know, and I, I, I talked about this earlier. When I look out the window and I see a field, I see I see a, a world that I can that I can go into. And what is in that what are, what is in that cornfield, right? What is what is out there that doesn't exist? What you know? What alien technology is under the ground? What what's a, what's above the atmosphere? So it's kind of like as a creative person, you always want to try to project yourself and envision all the things you can do with one item. So I can take like one item in a, in a game or a level. I can take this tank and I can start thinking of all the things I could do to that tank. I can take this tree. I can think of all the things I want to do to that tree. I can think of this road. What do I want to do to this road? What's under the road? What's above the road? Um, are you guys you know, understanding what I'm saying? So you, you kind of want to start to like create things that don't exist around you. And you want to use reference material, because those reference material, that reference material can help you think about that. Now, I apply a lot of these same concepts to UI design. When, I, when I'm looking at a UI, when I'm building a UI for a mobile platform or for a VR platform or for a PC game or for a, a, a mobile game, I, I, you also have to think about the platform form and like what the technology is and what you can do to what you can get away with and what you can apply to that platform. And so um, when, I'm when I was looking at this road, and I'll show you examples, I asked some, some guys on the team and everything kind of fell flat. So, but I think when you work with designers that are experienced or you work with other people, you'll start to um, they'll start helping you become more creative. So good, good creative people will help you learn to be creative. Some people say you can't learn creativity, but I think you can. I think anyone can learn creativity. And so, um, so what, I, what we did is um, I said, well, let's just take one of our assets here, right, which is like a, a half track. And it's parked, it's parked in there. And, and so you pull up on it, and it's damaged. Maybe it's smoking. So you just pull up on the road, and there's like a broken down car, right, like a broken down vehicle. So I'm like, that's more interesting than not having anything, or just pulling in and start shooting guys. That'd be kind of boring to me, right? So when I wanted to enter, enter the game, I wanted you to pull in. I wanted there to be this like empty, empty half track, like it was blown up. But it kind of makes you nervous because you're looking at it and you're like, well, what's that? What's going to happen here? And so the first thing we do in VR is what, what I did is when you pull up onto it, you know, we have guys that pop out of the vehicle. We have guys that start to show up. So they're setting up an ambush. So I thought kind of like a cool ambush would be a good intro to the game to get you started. And I'll kind of show you an example of that. So I always like black bars when you start the beginning of a game. And so the tank, you, know, you start out, you see this abandoned vehicle, you pull up on it, and obviously with two, you kind of hear him like speak, so you kind of get you an alerted. So 
So kind of introducing a tutorial. And then the guys pop up out of the vehicle, right? And so uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is kind of anticipation. Like, just because these guys are popping up and I'm fighting them, like I'm shooting them in a firefight, I just don't want to be in a firefight. I want something interesting else. Well, you know, I want something else cool to happen. So I'm like, well, hey, guys, what else can we do to make this a little bit more interesting? And I thought it'd be kind of fun if you're in this firefight and you see two guys like running down the road trying to get away to get reinforcements or help. So uh, the next thing I, I wanted to implement was some guys like trying to run away. It's kind of bad that you're shooting them in the back, but it is a World War II game. So. So you're kind of like, you know, in a game, you're like, oh, those guys are getting away. I don't want them to get away. They're going to they're gonna go warn their buddies, right? OK, and since, since we've, we've made this, we've uh, done recent updates. Even like the team this week has uh, uh, updated the weapons, so they're higher poly. So the thing that we, what you want to really do when you're doing mobile is it's super hard to make a VR game like this on a mobile platform. So the approach is typically, you know, go super, super on the uh, um, optimization side as far as polygons, texture space, you know, everything you need. Because in VR, if you don't have a, a good frame rate, it's going to make you sick and nauseous. And it's not going to be a good experience. So the thing we did when we approached this title is we went for, you know, super high uh, frame rate, super high uh, immersiveness. And, and we, wanted, we wanted to make sure that things worked really well and had a close to 60 frames per second on mobile, which is really tricky to do. And so um, that was kind of like the number one priority. And so now, now that the game's out and it's live, you guys can go download it and play it if you want. It's called Winter Fury. But you, what you want to do is uh, now we're slowly going back and up the art assets and coming back and adding things. So the first approach was how do we make it fun? How do we make the frame rate really high? You know, how do we make it immersive? How do we make it great? And the second thing is, you know, now we, now that now that it runs really well, how do we start to up-res the weapons and start and, and make that start to make the art assets better? So the trees now have like needles on them; they're not so low poly, and and uh, we're starting to slowly go back and give it give the game a, a face a facelift. And so uh, another thing I wanted to talk about in, uh, in 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 games is UI and UI design, which is what I do a lot at Samsung. And, and, uh, and we, we work on three platforms, mobile, uh, Samsung VR. So if you guys go into the Samsung VR right now, if you go into the, there's a room that you go into, and it's got a couch and uh, a window and a city and, and, and like a UI that you actually interact with and, and do those things. Those things are all very uh, game-like. So even though it's a video service and, and the video service is immersive and you can interact with things in your video service, all those assets are real time, they're optimized for mobile, and they're very similar in the same process of how this game was made. So that's why it's so great that you guys are doing game content and learning that process, even from a technical s side of you know, programming and art and design. You can, apply these, you can apply these techniques to anything. So you just don't want to limit yourself to, to game development. It, but even though games are fun, and I, I'm not discouraging that, it's just that there's a lot of things you can do with it. And so you guys, you guys see where, where, where that was a short little burst of a, a miniature game session. When I, when I make games, I tend to break them up in little sections, and little sections of bites of fun instead of just like, uh, and you could basically have one really great game mechanic to work off of, which is like the first person shooter element. And you can kind of like spread that or riddle it through. So you find that one thing that's really fun in your game, and you design it. Or you find that one really good strong point in a UI, and you, you keep it consistent. So you want to be very consistent in your design philosophies when you're developing games. So like, and then what I do is I tend to, tend to make, lay out the level. I draw out the level. Like these are all, these are all the choke points and the different things that happen in a, in, a, in a design process. And then I slowly build on top of that. So I, I progress you through the game. I start you out with like one weapon, obviously, just like a lot of first-person shooters. And I start to build up and give you more things to work with. But do you guys see how that, that little short process of, hey, abandoned vehicle, guys are in it. Uh, instead of just shooting people, oh, two guys are trying to get away, they got information, becomes more of a story in your mind, even though it's just a, it's a small miniature bite size of a game event. And the whole game uh, kind of progresses through a, a bunch of scenarios that are like that. And so uh, uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to go over some UI concepts. But uh, also, like when we're in the pre-production mode, we you know, uh, later in the game, you have guys that kind of like get out of the vehicle. So we do like uh, mock-ups, like uh, we do mock-ups in our in our packages of like you know how guys would disperse from vehicles, you know how they hop out before you're shooting them, 
And so, like, uh, in different parts of the game, you know, they, they move in on you, they're on their heavier weapon, they're in their catapult, and then they park and they all disperse. And the cool thing about it is when they disperse, you can actually shoot them as they're coming out of the vehicles and they can fall over and, you know, while they're in midair and stuff like that as they're piling out. Um, so we do a lot of pre-production pre as far as animation and uh, uh, breaking things up into little storyboards and animati animating them separate before we add them into the game engine. Okay, so for on, on like the UI or design process, you typically want to think about UIs that are coherent with your world. Like and I saw like a dungeon game out there and someone used the old dungeon uh, font and they were trying to do some of that, that's great. So you always want to you know, have your art style, your vision consistent with your environment or your look and feel. And so um, you know, one of the things I, I, I do is I look at a lot of reference material and I don't think I have the directory that has all the reference material in it, which I wish I could show. Um, let me see that. Yeah. So like here's a here's an example of all the reference material I get I got for just UIs. So you can see I got a lot of World War II art, a lot of old style kind of like if you look at the the color and the tones of these old posters, like you know I wanted to get that kind of look and feel on our on our on our UI. And so uh, you know going through here's a current game UI, but uh, you know maps, tones, colors, like that that whole kind of like t uh, vibe. And that's why it's so important to look at you know uh, reference material, look at what was done during that period, so you can kind of match it to your style. Uh, I had another guy on the team which is kind of doing more level editing or level design. I think he was getting the right idea because he kind of used the font that was like like World War II, and it was kind of like. You know, I, I was kind of giving them the idea of like a dog tags and things like that. But you know, when I looked at it, uh, you always don't want to be happy with your first few iterations of design. It depends on it depends on the designer. But you always always want to you know kind of like push the boundaries of what you're capable of. And so like when you look at something, here's here's a good example. I, I thought this was a really nice kind of uh, this this influenced me, even though it doesn't look anything like what I did. But I was like, that's a cool UI. That 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 was something that I found online. Um, so this, I kind of started thinking about old newspapers, like and the name of the game and like a victory screen. And so, and then I was thinking of a star system, which is very Angry Birds, right? In every other game that you see, and then uh, you know I started thinking about times, old old timey watches, and and so I'm doing this in Photoshop, so I'm mocking these things up in Photoshop before you know, I go to VR. And then I started thinking about metals, so I started building these metals up and, paint, and kind of painting them up and getting them crisper. And I use, uh, you, know, you can grab photo references and just drop some of that stuff in. And then I started thinking about font and score. And, and, uh, and then an interesting border right around the outside. And so, uh, and then like, uh, what, what is the screen and what does it do? And it's a battle result screen, right? This is my result screen. And, and so another thing I like, like with immersive UI is uh, one thing we did I thought was kind of neat is I, I, since you're in VR, a lot of VR games I noticed all had UIs everywhere and they popped up and they, were, they had things floating in 3D, which is fine, they were doing that. But I, since it's World War II, I wanted you to feel like you're more in the world. So I was like, well, how do we make health more interesting? Uh, and how do we make health without you like, you know, looking, looking in the world and seeing your health bar meter. And so the way we did that was with, wound, with getting wounded. So when, you, when you're playing the game and you get shot, your hands get progressively bloody and they get bandaged up and your jacket gets really bloody. So you can see that right there, I'm taking damage because I, I got some blood on my sleeve. And they get really bloody once you're like, and then we also did another thing which is breathing. So you, when you get, take more damage, you get heavy breathing and it starts to make you, you know, you're, you're, you're more wounded. So we kind of removed the, moved the health UI and made it kind of like a tactile, kind of like a, you know, uh, a visceral UI, like one that was more uh, feedback, feedback to what you're doing. I'm trying to get to the results screen. And by the way, one of the, one of the students here at Richland worked on this game. Okay, I'm trying to get this uh, UI to pop up. There it is. So there goes the stars. So notice how all those things were on a flat screen, but now they're all broken up and they're all applied to kind of fly out, you know, and then also like the, you know, how do we do a loading screen that's kind of like, let me show you a little subtleties. So little things that are subtle to me is, 
uh, I want to, I just, you know, instead of being a, since it's VR, why don't we take advantage of the UI? So I felt like having a knife that was stuck in all the different things that you're doing in the game would kind of show what you're doing or where you're progressing. So in the main room in the map, we have a, a knife that goes to the different locations. I have a knife that goes into the different menus. I have the, so the knife is kind of used everywhere. And also when you're playing at it, when you look down, you have the knife on your hip and you have, you have a grenade belt that we just added. So you have the grenades that you can throw and you have a knife on your belt. And other little things that tie in, which is kind of like, you know, how do I tie in a loading screen with that same element, which is a knife? So this is a flat a loading screen, which kind of looks 3D, but you can see like the blood's kind of draining out and they have loading and then I use the two dots at the end to kind of like loading screen and then there's a slight reflection of the character inside the knife. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so, so these are all little things that you want to do like to really you know, make UI stronger, you know, make things more like part of the world that you're in, you know, how do they interact with the world, how do you tie that into the world. And you apply these same things to both mobile and to, and to VR and to video and you know, clean design, uh, uh, you know, how, how does it, how, it, it, a lot of people will approach UI and environment and art separate, and I tend to want to apply them together. Is how does the UI interact with the environment? And that's especially important with VR, because VR is 3D and it's immersive. So you want to you think about all these things like in design. I look at design and game design and UI as all the same thing. And some people will say, oh, well, you know, this is UI design, it's separate. I don't think it is. I think a lot of these things are kind of in this symbiotic world and they all work together, including engineering and programming. Programming. So you, how do this all work together and how do you work on a team and how do you build great products? You're working together to collaborate, to come up with great ideas and to uh, work together. Uh, I think we have like uh, time to answer questions and uh, if you have any technical questions or any game development questions, you can actually ask Jeff too. And Jeff has been making and designing and doing games and, and uh, Andrew's background is, is on, in engineering and development, so VR is very similar to game development too and, and also to uh, video. But I, I would like to see you guys like use Samsung VR as a service to uh, make interactive videos and I'm going to talk to Chris about that because uh, another thing I've seen recently is a lot of people are going out and shooting films shooting films to do pre-production for video games. So like if I wanted to storyboard out a video game or a scenario, you know, you could even make it interactive, is how do I run through this environment like with my camera and then apply it to both either a game or an interactive game-like experience. So I think you guys could do a lot of cool things and I, I would like to work with Chris to kind of like maybe talk to, about a program here that we could t potentially do that with. And you, you guys have cool content, you could eventually end up on Samsung's platform, which would be great.